And what about you? And on the ramp today we have a 2011 Volvo XC90 D5 on the all-wheel drive. Customer complaint is he's getting drivetrain noises. He's not too sure where it's coming from the front or coming from the back, but there's knocking going on whenever he takes off in first and second gear. So, followers of the channel may recognize this car. Now, there's a couple of XC90s. This exact same color appears on the channel. There's a manual one and an automatic one. This is the manual one. This one has, it now has 300 odd thousand miles on it. The guy has owned this car from new. And what we did, we did a handbrake, parking brake modification. And we'll put a wee link up in the cards there. We did it about it a year to 18 months ago, something like that, and the guy states that the handbrake has never worked as good as it, do, it does now with that modification. So it used to have to get the cable adjusted before it went through and it just about scraped through MOT, but now he says, oh, it's, it's fantastic. It's the way it should be. So yeah, but for now, he's got a problem and it may be something to do with a prop shaft. Don't know. So we could maybe rule out a few things based on, on what the customer has told us. So let's, let's see what he says. So first and second gear, just taken off, first and second gear, he gets this sort of clunking noise, a drivetrain type noise, you know? Sometimes it's hard to tell, he says, it's maybe from the front, could be from the back. Most of the time he thinks it's from the back, but the odd time you would think it was from the front. Now, we do have a connection between the back and the front. And this is a rudimentary diagram that I actually drew for the customer, just, just to explain to him. There's a, a heap of possibilities here. But as I say, we could maybe rule a brave few of them out, just by on the basis of what he said. So let's see. First and second gear only, whenever the car is driving along and he gets going, it's fine, you know? So it's only when torque is being applied to get the thing to move, you know? So here we have an angle gear, they're known to strip. If that was stripped and it was jumping the splines, well, that would be there all the time. You know, that wouldn't disappear once you get moving. Again, bearings in the rear diff, on the older ones especially, they were soft and no one to uh, give bother. But that would be a burning noise, that would be a droning noise. And again, it would actually get worse the faster you go. So that's that's not the, the sort of symptom here. Another one that's known to be a problem is this. There's a front, there's a CV joint at the front where it comes out of the bevel box or the angle box, whatever you want to call it. And it's right beside the exhaust. And what happens is, you know, the grease, it gets heated up and by the exhaust and the heat and all, and the grease, melts and runs out of it and then it becomes dry and that's how that feels. Now that is replaceable, this front CV joint. Then you have universal joints on your prop shaft, center bearing on your prop shaft, another universal joint and then a CV joint at the back before it goes into the Haldex coupler. Uh, and then, then the Haldex coupler is bolted to the differential. So the differential is pretty straightforward, normal type differential. Uh, the Haldex coupler is a series of clutch plates, which when put under pressure from uh, a pump, hydraulic pressure that is, you know, they get squeezed together and engages this prop shaft to this diff. So this prop shaft is directly connected here. It spins all the time, but it's disconnected at this point from the rear diff. A number of potential failure points, but these things here, now the center bearing, yes, whenever you take up torque, you know, and it's moving about, it'll go clunk, clunk, you know, and, uh, but you might, you, you know, I would imagine it would clunk and what have you pretty regular, you know, it wouldn't be just taken off. So another thing he, ha he happened to say, he just happened to say it in passing, that he says, in traffic, this is, this is, it, it's just clunking like mad in traffic where he has to move and stop and stop and start and all, where he's moving in first gear. And I'm going, right, well, 
it's it's not the universal joints it's not the angle gear it's not the diff it's not you, you know what i mean so i'm sort of managing to rule a whole lot of things out here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a camera on the front here so he say like he says the the, the noise is either from the back or the front he thinks it's from the back but but we'll have a, a big bar connecting the two together so the sound can travel you know so we'll put a camera at the front and we'll put a camera at the back So that was the that was the front CV joint, and it looks alright to me. Sound wise, well, you're getting deafened a wee bit by the engine, but I think that's fine. So we'll have a wee look at footage from the back. Right, not happy with that. So we can see that when we drive, when we take up torque, the whole diff assembly is going up and down. If you watch the uh, pump, if you look at the, the, the pump at the bottom, and we'll just run a wee bit again here. So it goes up and down and up and down whenever we're first, second, but whenever we get moving again, you know, there's no real torque. So the torque is there, you know, the, the wheels being on the ground and the weight of the car is preventing the, you know, the thing from moving. So, you know, the torque is being applied through the prop shaft and trying to get the, the mass uh, moving from stationary. So, yeah, I think I know what the crack is here. It's stuck in all wheel drive. So this is a Generation 4 Haldex coupler and uh, yeah, where it differs from the older Volvos, the maybe like 06 or in around that model year, is that it has this thing up in here, you can just about see it there, that thing there is a pressure accumulator, so I'll oh, ease them in maybe, let's see, it says on it, oh, it's not going to focus. It says on it, do not open, on that thing there. On the Volkswagens, again, it's still a generation four, but that pressure accumulator thing is, is more so at the side over here. It, it sticks out the side on these ones here. And I think it's more or less identical to the Land Rover Freelanders, that pressure accumulator, that wee sort of round thing there, uh, behind, behind the flange, the drive flange is you know, towards the front, as is the the pump motor here. So there's a wee tiny wee gap. So yeah, the thing about the, the, the reason why I'm interested in this pressure accumulator is, as the name suggests, it accumulates the pressure. So it stores the pressure that this pump, uh, you know, makes. So. Whenever you turn the ignition on, 
this pump will run for like 10 or 20 seconds or something and then it runs every now and again uh you know to put pressure in that accumulator and the pressure accumulator stores that pressure and the idea then is that the storage of the pressure in here is whenever uh, the, the all-wheel drive is required you know it detects slip on a wheel from the wheel speed sensor you know the pressure is there and it's ready to go so it engages right away the generation threes had a pressure sensor an electronic pressure sensor these generation fours do not they do it sort of mechanically and the accumulator also then uh, as part of its assembly incorporates a pressure relief valve so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to disconnect this multi-plug going into this ecu this one here and wait for about half an hour for you know any pressure that's in this accumulator you know to sort of bleed down you know and see whether this thing goes out of all-wheel drive and you know we'll get footage and see if this this thing's gonna move about and jump about and i can tell from driving it you know that these back wheels are pushing the front So while I'm waiting on that, I'll just uh, I printed off a few things. Now this this is this is from a Volkswagen Generation Four, but it's the same thing. It's it's slightly different, as I mentioned in that other wee clip. But while we're waiting, and this and I'll just try and explain my thinking here. You know, so there we have our all-wheel drive clutch at the back there. So right, I already know that angle transmission propeller shaft. And all that there, and that is the pressure accumulator. So it's just a big spring. Well, it's two springs. It's one spring inside another spring, and that's why it says on it "Do not open" because there is some force going on. That is that is compressed to nothing. But this McClatchy here at the end is a pressure relief valve. So it's like a mechanical pressure relief valve, which will blow off at thirty bar. So that's how it sort of regulates the pressure, you know? So it doesn't do it with a pressure sensor. It doesn't know the, the, the pressure in this. So there's no point looking at live data or anything like that. So my thinking, this, this thing's stuck on all-wheel drive. Okay, so this pressure isn't getting either relieved or there's something. Now, here's, here's another thing. Here's another thing. So everybody will probably chime in to say, a lot of these units, a lot of these Haldex units, when they were put in the sort of earlier models, the dealers didn't have them on their service uh, regime. So a lot of these here have went unserviced, not serviced at all. And in the generation four, it's even the design of it is sort of indicative of this isn't sort of designed to be serviced because there is a drain, there is a drain hole, a drain plug, in the top of it but there's no you know there's no there's nowhere to for it to drain out so what you have to basically do is remove the pump and uh you know the pump is at the lowest point and let it drain out the pump there is a filter but i remember in an early uh early documentation that it basically said that was like not replaceable you didn't need to replace it and some of the some of the manufacturers might have been different and they all maybe changed as they went along so it was, uh, I knew one guy and he his thinking was that, you know, it was because the manufacturers didn't make the Haldex unit because it was made by Borg Warner. They just didn't, they didn't publish any information on it because they, you know, they didn't make it. But anyway, that's another theory. So the thing that controls the pressure is this N373, which is basically like a spool valve. And it's, it's basically like, you know, the, the valve type of valve that would control your variable valve timing or something like that. So duty cycle controlled and it open, opens and closes, but it also has a relief port in it that, you know, it will ble then bleed back the, uh, 
the excess fluid back down into the sump, as it were, into the bottom. So anyway, this guy has owned this car from you, this Volvo here. And to his knowledge, to his knowledge, this Haldax unit has never been serviced. And the car's 10 year old and there's what, 307,000 miles on it. So will just cleaning all this out fix this? Not sure. Uh, the other possibility is that, see that N373? See, see if that isn't closing. You know, it's not fully closing. Say it's full of muck or it's just worn, you know, the center bore and it's not fully closing. Then it will just apply pressure all the time. So this pump runs, it's sort of like every now and again, it runs, it just runs and it builds up and it makes sure that there's always pressure in this unit. And it's supposed to be regulated by this relief valve, which is set at 30 bar. So these springs are set at 30 bar to, you know, to release the pressure. And that's, that's basically it. And then, you know, whenever the all wheel drive is wanted, you know, the ECU will open this valve and allow pressure and push on the clutches and engage the prop shaft. Anyway, there's a wee bit more that. Let's see. What's that say? From pump to valve. Yes, return to oil reservoir. So this is the return part of it. Uh, pressure chamber, uh, return, return to oil reservoir. So, where are we? Get you in the shot. If the oil pressure exceeds 30 bar, the return channels become accessible and pressure in the direction of the oil reservoir is reduced and the oil returns to the reservoir. So see if this accumulator isn't doing that. There's not much we can do, you know. Uh, there is one guy in uh, England, I think, who can or says that he has a fix for these accumulators. But generally speaking, you, you, you can, there's nothing you can do with these accumulators. If this accumulator isn't returning that pressure, for whatever reason, like the orifices are blocked or something, it's uh, neat, neat. Nothing we can do about it. But there's, we might be able to do, you know, we might be lucky. It's it's sort of flick of the coin this a wee bit. So this N373 valve, they're to oil reservoir. So let me see, from accumulator, Two working piston, so the oil comes out of the accumulator into here at somewhere less than 30 bar because it blows off at 30 bar and into there, and then this goes back. So the, if this isn't closing, if this isn't, if this is remaining open, this is just this is just feeding uh, pressure into that into the clutches all the time, you know. So there's no electrical fault here or nothing like that. So this is like a hydraulic circuit fault, as it were. So yeah, there's that. Uh, oh yes, here's another thing. Here's another thing. I heard people talking about this, and it says here about uh, because a small amount of pressure is applied through the spring plate, a speed of 31 miles an hour and a distance of 31 miles may not be exceeded when towing with a one axle raised. So I've heard reports about people saying that if cars with these generation four type Haldaxes are dragged along with their back wheels rotating for more than, what does that say, 31 miles an hour, it can actually damage this Haldax coupler because it sort of back pressures it, you know? So what does that say there? The illustration shows in the system the depressurized state as long as the engine off, all wheel drive is selected and no pressure is generated. So, ah, here, the Haldex clutch control N373 is opened without current. So if the wheels are rotated, it's actually open in the valve without current applied to it. Ah, right, so that maybe explains, you know, people saying that there's failures if you tow the thing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's mad, you know. So, uh, what's that? Oh, that's the same thing. Oh, here. There's a big one I've printed out of that, same thing. So anyway, here's, this is my thinking, right? This is my thinking. Motor, pump, cartridge, filter, 
never changed as far as we know. You know what I mean? There's a non-return valve on the top of that as well, by the way. So pump, pumps pressure into the accumulator, into here, GD cycle control, opens that, puts pressure on the clutches, closes, closes the clutches, puts it in the all-wheel drive. I reckon we're permanently in all-wheel drive. So this is supplying loads of pressure to this all the time. So if it isn't bleeding off here, bleeding back, then we're sort of goosed. There's nothing much we can do. If it's still a plan, now what we're going to do then is, or what we'll have to, <laughs> what we're going to see, I mean, is with this pump motor disconnected, so it cannot apply anymore, and this, there's nothing going to this either. So this is dormant then. This is like a dormant system. We're going to drive this and see what happens. Um, yeah. So, okay. We'll rig a camera up below and see if this thing's going to move about. Okay, we can see in that footage here that the diff isn't moving up and down whenever it take off, you know. So I can also tell just driving it in the slow speed corner. So we took it down the end of the, the drive and uh, I did a three point turn. So whenever you turn the, the front wheels, it's steering into the, into the corner better. So, you know, the back wheels aren't pushing it anymore. So from that and the knocking noise has gone as well. So from that, we can tell that this clutch then, these clutch plates in this assembly here, has now released with the motor and the pump, and the motor and the pump is one thing, and this valve are disconnected electrically. So we, to recap, we, we allowed the, the pressure to sort of bleed back. We sort of let it sit for about half an hour thereabouts. You know, just let all that, all that that hydraulic fluid, uh, the hydraulic oil just, you know, drop down to, into the sump. Now, um, whenever you turn it, no, it's whenever you start the engine, whenever you start the engine, uh, it runs this motor, you know, and it probably duty cycles this very slightly, you know, but it runs this motor to build up the pressure in the accumulator, you know. So what we can deduce here is this bit is okay. So that bit there, these clutches are fine. So mechanically, if you want, it's all right. You know what I mean? The pump runs and the pump works, you know, the motor's okay. And it, it sort of just leaves, it. what can we do here? You know, we can't change that bit. You know, that's a non-serviceable item. But we can change that and we're going to do a, you know, we're going to make sure these ga galleries are blown out and they're clear and all that sort of stuff. Get as much oil out of it as we can. Bit of brake cleaner and what have you, you know. And we can change this. You know, this is this is easy to change. Um, so it lives behind where the control module is. So as I said, if this isn't closing, if it's remaining open all the time or some of the time, you know, it just lets the pressure that's that's in this storage device here you know through and permanently engages these clutches so when i was driving it there that's it's sort of like the difference between an all-wheel drive and a four before you know a four-wheel drive there's no center differential here 
So there's, there's no center differential in the middle. A four-wheel drive, a permanent four-wheel drive now, has a center differential to split the back from the front. In this car, whenever this is engaged, the back and the front are directly coupled. So that's why it doesn't corner very well. If, if That's how you sort of know that this is, this is stuck closed, you know, stuck in four-wheel drive. So you can tell, you can just tell by driving it, never mind, you know, the knock noise and all that stuff. But this here seems to be okay. If those friction plates were, you know, fused together or burnt out or something and they're welded together, then, you know, the, the units the units scrap and probably the easiest fix is just take a, take a prop shaft off and run it as a two-wheel drive. But, uh, yeah, so... What I'm going to do then, what I'm going to recommend the customer is, but it's not guaranteed, is we change this valve and we do an oil change and a good clear out. So, okay, we'll order up a kit and we'll get her going. Good practice, they say, is to make sure you can loosen this before you do anything, you know. And we can't. <laughs> a bigger ratchet. We'll change the half inch drive. Oh, come on. So I'm going to attempt to do this without removing this flange. So to remove this flange, you would have to take a drive shaft off and uh, drop a center bearing on this car. This is the exhaust pipe. So, I'll probably have to drop it too. So, there are people that say you can, you can take this out without taking the flange out. It makes it a hell of a lot more awkward for the filter up top. But because, like, there's a couple of things going on here. I don't know why uh, this will fix this, you know? So, I don't want to put too much time in it. And you could argue, well, ultimately we may end up, you know, Taking the drive shaft off anyway, or the prop shaft, I should say. Uh, but that is a T8, and that is no good. That will strip that. So that is a T10. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take these. I'm going to make sure I'm going to loosen everything first. So I'm, I'm going to loosen. The, there's a couple of wee bolt, wee tiny wee torxes that hold this pump cover onto the pump and then that allen is, is holding the, the pump into the casing. So if we remove these two, there's one on the other side over here, if we remove these two and these wee allens and see if we can get this casing to clear here and then that means, you know, it'll expose the armature and all that, it'll carry on. Hopefully we can pull the pump out without having to take this flange off. On the, on, now, if you're watching this and you own a Freelander or whatever, depending on the engine size, you could have a bigger flange. So this flange here could be a larger diameter because there's a damper on it, you know, so there's a rubber sort of damper on it. So with a bigger engine sizes, you might have a bigger flange and then you have to take the flange off. You have no, you have no, it'll, it'll, no chance this will clear it. But because, We'll have a bit of a gap here. We'll make it away with it. Just broke up. But they all are okay. That's that wee set screw there. But you know that that 
Alan is holding that cover on as well, so I'm not too worried about that. And that's that's holding that cover on anyway, so I'm not too bothered about breaking. Will not be too worried about it. Not lose any sleep over it. There were two set screws out, they were 4mm Allen's. So, it's in there. Both sides and our wee tiny wee Torx, one broke. We'll see if we can get this cover off. If it's going to clear. So it's being pulled back with the magnets. And it's just not going to clear. Nearly is. Uh, don't want to force anything here. So we've given up on that so-called shortcut. So we've went ahead and dropped the exhaust and uh, well, we're gonna, I'm gonna do it the way you're supposed to do it. That's the DPF sitting in the lifting table there. So drop the prop shaft and uh, take a flange off. Right, so we have the DEM removed there, I think that's what you call it, the uh, differential electronic module or something like that. And I have the, let me see, the center bearing released from the body. It's just sitting in that bit of wood at the moment, but that's more or less where it's hanging anyway, you know, just to take a strain off it. And our next trick is to try and separate this flange from the prop. I'll put a bit of a yellow marker on there so uh, it'll go back on exactly. Now in the back here, if we can get up in there, there's a couple of holes. So the threaded holes there you can see are uh, where the bolts, the fixing bolts went in and then there's a hole in between some of them some of these flanges that have that threaded i think the generation three it's threaded the idea is you put a bolt in there you know and that press it out but you know just our luck this one here it's not threaded so we'll have to see what we can do to try and separate this i have this long punch here it's very small but it's long you know just a bit clears I don't know whether it doesn't help us do anything. May break the seal like. And there we are, prop shaft out. So the trick is that you know, you need to have plenty of slack in the prop shaft. You know, you need the center burn dropped and you know plenty of uh, room for it to go somewhere, you know what I mean? So it has to go somewhere to come out. If it's still if it's still up in, you know, up in the recess, and it's nowhere to go. So there's our punch still in into one of the unthreaded holes there in between the threaded holes. So the clip I showed you about uh, breaking the seal 
was on on this one you know so there's one opposite each other so broke it on that one and then spun around and a couple of taps there and that was it and it just pulled out Right, so now that the flange is off, um, we can get this pump out, but how do we wiggle it out there? Oh, it's uh, it's kind of stuck. So I've just left these screws in, just by sort of like a thread, so it doesn't pop and fly across the floor. So I'm just going to try and give it a couple of taps from below. Maybe I'll get a screwdriver up in there and right? get her wedged.
Let's see if there's much dirt in this. This is a pump head. Yeah. Bit manky, as you would expect. So I'm going to pull this fill plug out. And, uh... My arm's probably in the road of everything here. I'm going to see if I can give it a wee toot with the air. It's got quite a big hole. So that's the oil then that came out of this thing. It's pretty black. And you see that sort of grey stuff there? Do you see it? That's what came out of that filter. You know? So, and actually, see, to be honest with you, it's not as bad as I would have thought it would have been. You know? But, uh, well, look at our pump and the strainer on the pump. Again, it's sort of not as bad as I would have thought of them. So we'll clean all that up, put a brake cleaner. We've new uh, O-rings there, new seals for the ground here. Take note, there's a large one and a small one. So I bought this as a kit. So yeah, so new filter and new rings and uh, yeah, a copper washer too for the, for the fill bung. So yeah, okay, we we'll also have a new one of these. This is the one out of the car. Now, we're changing this just on the off chance that this might, might solve this uh, permanent four wheel drive or all wheel drive issue. There's no electrical fault in this car for this, uh, for any of these units here, so we don't know whether that's cured or not, but just doing an oil change for me isn't good enough. You know, we're going to do the oil change anyway because we're actually changing this. The other thing to note is, so this is the, the DEM or the ECU or whatever you want to call it, the control unit. So that by our plugs in there, you know. Now, Land Rover. The Freelanders, which has these Gen 4s, don't know about Volvo, but they issued, they put out a, a software fix for this issue, you know? So basically what the software fix did was it just basically reprogrammed the way that it controlled this spool valve. So it, it put less duty onto this valve, so it didn't open as much. That's really all that did. So it's a bit of a, well, it's a bit of a, a bluff, like, you know, sort of maybe eased the complaint, you know, wasn't really, didn't really fix it as such, but it sort of masked the underlying problem, which is probably the accumulator. But we sort of can't do much about that without completely reconditioning the unit or replacing it which we're not gonna do. So anyway, clean up, clean up all the aluminum face and surfaces on the car and on here and what have you. And we'll get her back there again. Now for pump back in again, uh, new filter up the top, in behind the flange, flange on, and uh, the nut there. Now, you're supposed to use a new nut, but I haven't got a new nut. But anyway, so good idea to put a wee bit of thread locker on it. Uh, 
there is thread locker on the nut, red thread locker. But uh, this here, I think the Land Rover thing says 140 meters. I think Volvo says 150, but I'm going to do it 140. So this is going to be tricky. I don't know where I'm going to be able to film this. So this this counter hold is two bits. Of, it's a homemade counter hold. It's uh, just my favourite counter hold. Two bits of angle iron. The two uh, bolts here are not in the threaded holes. They're in the in the unthreaded holes. You know. So, and I don't want to. I don't want to. I could get at the hole there against there, but that's that's a plastic fuel tank. So. I have to, you really need three hands for this. This will slip off, I bet you. So you need, really need somebody to hold it on there, you know. So I might have to jam this somewhere, this counter hold. But we'll see how we go. Sometimes you do these things. You wonder if I got it, if I got it set at 140 or a, or 240. Is this gonna slip? It doesn't. It's a very shallow nut. Here's the excuses. Get there in a minute. <laughs> Click. Forty newton meters on these things here. Bit of red thread locker on it as well. Right, so we're ready for filling with oil. I'm just going to show you on this wee makeup table here what I have been using. Some of the sort of specialist things that I've been using, and uh, some of the things that we're going to use for filling this. So I use one of these here transmission oil filling system and you get an array of adapters that one there's for DSG, that one there's for CVT and all that but I've sort of made up for hold axes this sort of end here because you know it's just a wee bit more flexible and that small pipe is for a hold axe 5 because the filler hole is quite small so that's what that's actually for but because it's now not rigid. It's good for getting up into chassis and stuff, you know? So a thing to note is I use this for filling manual transmissions. So I have just given this a good clean out. I've filled it full of, not full, but a drop of brake cleaner, 
in that and allowed the brake cleaner to go into the hose and then blew it out with the airline with a blowgun. So you do not want heavy oil, like gear oil, into this Haldex coupler. It will jam the friction plates if you allow a heavy weight oil, like 75, W90 or something like that, into this Haldex oil. It is a special oil for Haldexes and the kit that uh, we purchased to do this job came with the Haldex oil, which is Febby. It's 0.85 of a litre. So there we can see it's not even a litre, but that's, that's all you need. We get this syringe, which I'll show you what the crack is with this syringe and a bit of this pipe. We get the O-rings, a, a new uh, filler plug seal thing. We get this here that I had to put a screw in to get it out. We get a new one of the ME covers and we get a tried and tested genuine uh, filter because as I said earlier in the video, I think when we're looking at the drones, there's a known return valve in this, that's it there. And aftermarket ones of these, see that wee known return valve there? So that's a wee sprung thing. And uh, the aftermarket ones that you maybe get on your favorite online marketplace, marketplace don't sell. So the guy that supplied all this stuff to us has tested these and he only makes sure he supplies this is a this is the one this is the one out of it. It says Haldax on it and uh, a few markings on it, whatever. It's probably made by Borg Warner, but it doesn't say Borg Warner on it. So the guy that supplied all this in this kit form we had to buy this separately, but off the same person. I think that was about 70 quid for that spill valve there, which we are replacing. You know, because we're, we're not just doing a service here. We're trying to get this thing its best chance for the function properly. And that's why we blew out all the oil and as much oil as we could and all that there. But anyway, here's, here's the sender of that. Haldax repairs that Cody UK came in this box. And crew it comes from in England. So that came in a couple of days, uh, 24 hour postage or whatever it is. So that's what we purchased. He sells this, this all comes in a kit. With that, that the rings and the filter, tried and tested, which it looks like a genuine filter to me that he supplied, but not an aftermarket one. You don't buy aftermarket ones of them. And you get a new e-cover plate new screws and uh, all that that was separate you get this here because you need to drain back a wee bit of fluid out and we'll, we'll go through the procedure anyway but uh, I'll just show you some of the other tools that I was using there which you mightn't uh, you know a lot of people mightn't have or whatever so as I said we're going to use that thing there to fill it and it comes with all those adapters I've made my own but it's only a bit of pipe the counter hold for the uh, drive shaft on the flange is I know, a fan belt in that tool there. And uh, these are an old tool from years ago that you maybe don't see anymore, people sort of use it. But uh, this one's made by Top Tool. Six Picofin also make that, but they're horrifically expensive. And as far as I can see, it's exactly the same thing. That's the model number there, if you Google that. Um, the punch that I used to punch that drive shaft out was that one there. So that's it there, it's out of that kit there. I got that years ago, besides that. That one there's a beefy bio. But uh, it's because of the length of them, you know. So look, I don't know why you'll be able to get that anywhere. Newsome tool, I have no idea. I've had that for years. That there is a generic cheapo uh, harmonic balancer pillar. That's what that is. And uh, yeah, it, it done the job. It's pretty rubbish, but for light sort of things, if there's, you know, if, if that flange had been like really stuck on, you know, that probably would have bent or something or whatever. But, you know, if it's just a, if it's just a pull and uh, it done the job and it fitted perfectly, 
I've got three bolts in and I pulled it nice and straight. So there we go. Then you, for this uh, time anyway, you fill it up basically until it runs out. And uh, I'll maybe put a wee tiny wee bit more in just to make sure. But I think I said it earlier, this is a filler hole, this isn't a level. So this doesn't dictate your level. She's running out. So we'll let that drip and uh, we'll put our bong in. Right, so we'll put our bong in at that. And at this stage, I'm just going to give her a nip up. So I'm not going to apply full torque on it just yet. That'll do. Right, so this is uh, what I'm following here. This is genuine factory data from Volvo. Active on demand coupling or AOC, Haldex coupler fluid level check so there's your bung for your filler hole and uh, the fluid must be allowed to escape until you until a continuous flow changes the single drop so just until it sort of drips so put enough fluid in it until it drips not a stream you know and then use transmission oil <laughs> again it's the proper oil it is not gear oil, you know, so it's not really transmission oil, but it gives a Volvo port number. So then it's, it goes on to say, put the bung back in again, torque the, the thing to 35 newton meters. I just nip that up, because it's not a final torque, if you know what I mean, because we're gonna do this step carry out road test so drive the thing that's basically what it says it doesn't say for how long it doesn't say how many miles I'd do a few miles on it you know and uh, give her a good hour run but anyway then you bring her back in again and you put it back up on your ramps or lift or whatever it is you're using and you take this bung out again so that's why I never torqued it up because you're going to be pulling it out again so you need to, you need to put enough of a nip on it so that it's not going to like lick you know so common sense and it says here be prepared to collect escaping fluid now that's okay in a sort of ad world but as you saw in the video i blew out all these passageways and do, done all that there so i expect there to be you know error in here so whenever that and the new there's a new filter and there's all that so you know, I sort of half expect this fluid level to drop a bit. So what I'm going to end up having to do, I think, don't know now, but we'll bring her back. We'll let her cool down a wee bit. You know, it says carry out road test. Doesn't say how long for. 
Clearly, when the flu if the fluid heats up, and I, I don't really expect it to heat up that much. It's not like a, it's not like if you're doing an automatic gearbox like that type of thing, where you have to have the fluid at a specified temperature because it expands. But anyway, we'll see if some uh, leaks out. But if none leak out, if nothing leaks out, if no fluid leaks out, I'm gonna top it up again until it's level with this filler hole. Again, this is not a level, this is a filler. So then what we do, so, we, so anyway, it asks for the fluid to be level with the hole. So it's expecting it to be level with the hole. So you make it that way, either way, you know what I mean? And again, allow the fluid to drip, single drops. And then we pull 40 milliliters out of it. And that's why in the kit that we bought, we get the syringe and we get a wee bit of pipe that goes onto that and uh, reading the wee cap on it. Like, and we'll pull 40 mil out. And it says on it, for single use. So you're supposed to do that and throw that in the bin. But, uh, well, you clean it out, I suppose. But anyway, that's why you get that. So you pull 40 mil out and that gets your level. So the level is now set with 40 mil below the, uh, the level of the filler hole. And then final torque, 35 newton meters on that bung. And that's you done. Now, point to note, this generation four Haldax is identical to the one on the Freelander. Land Rover Freelander. Land Rover Freelander 2. So if anybody's watching this and is doing, going to follow something similar here, but it's a Land Rover Freelander 2. Their specification, Land Rover says to pull 70 milliliters out of it. So, you know, 40, 70, whatever. Volvo says 40, Land Rover says 70. But that's what that's sort of telling me is that, you know, if you pull 50 out or if you pulled a wee bit more than the 40 or whatever, it's not really that crucial. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think, anyway. If one manufacturer says one thing and another manufacturer says something else, I might pull 50 out of it. And before I take this thing for a run, well, there's going to be faults in it. So it seems to be happy now because it was coming up, you know, a warning and the message there and a traction control light on or whatever. Whenever I drove it with the, uh, with that DEM disconnected at the back there. So here's our scan. What have we got? So we'll have induced fault, uh, faults. That's basically what I'm trying to say here. So communication with AOC module signal missing. So that's because we had to disconnect it. And there's something there about the beam signal too low. So that's all right. So brake control module. It'll probably be something similar, you know, communication error. Oh, go. Communication between control units. Communication problems with DEM. So that's differential electronic module. So that's the Haldex ECU, you know. So we'll get them cleared out and we'll take her for a bar. So just while I'm here, before us, for our first startup, there's, uh, I was in this here, differential electronic module. To see if there's any like adaptions or anything. Uh, there's no special functions. But, uh, well, we'll clear the codes out, so that should be all right. But let's see, in the live data, we'll have pump current. It's sitting at nine milliamps at the minute. Park and brake not activated. So I can't remember off the top of my head exactly, but the park and brake being on I, I can't remember exactly, but it definitely has an effect whether the, if the parking brakes on, it doesn't run the pump or something. Can't remember anyway, but it definitely has some sort of part to play. But anyway, our parking brake is off, which is the handbrake, you know. So, well, let's see. Hold on. Yeah, there's a parking brake on. So, we'll just take that off for a minute. But what we're interested in is pump current. So, this pump should, 
should run as soon as you turn the ignition on to build up the pressure, you know. But not for very long, like, you know, and then it should run sort of periodically. So we, we can see that, we can see that here, hopefully. All right, so let's run it. All right, so that's it off. So we run it for what, 10 seconds there? And there's a back on again. Off. Running very slightly. Oh, and that's the, uh, it's a parking sensor going mad. Oh, it's, it was a, it was running rightly there. Yeah. So the duty cycle's increasing there. There's more duty cycle, the more current flow. Right, anyway, take us out for a run. Right, so I've just went on a 10, 10 to 15 minute drive I did there. Uh, as a wee road test, wee test drive. So, you know, just took it for a drive, done a few miles, a couple of few, you know. Don't know how many, but anyway. We'll see if there's any oil comes out of this. So we're straight on to the ramp again as soon as we come back from the test drive. So if there is any heat in this, you know, it's not really warm. The exhaust's warm, below me. But yeah, we'll see if any fluid comes out because it suggested that fluid will come out. I can't see. Maybe there will. I don't know. See? Nothing. So, I need to fill that up again. You know? Now, clearly, I need to point out, you need to have your car level to do this. You know, the car needs to be, if it's up on ramps at the back end, this is, you know, it's never going to be right. So this, this car is on a, on a lifting platform, so this car is perfectly level. Right, so we're going to fill it. First thing, there's a, there's a wee drop left in our in our filling container. So we're gonna fill it until it uh, runs out and rips. Right, so it took a wee bit there. Did I mention, like, I can't remember where I'm at, or not. Well, on the test drive, by the way, this thing had no knocking, you know, everything, the car was driving as normal, and that was with the uh, DEM connected and, you know, pump running and all that. So, for the moment, anyway, this, well, the car's running grand. Whether it stays like that or not, it builds pressure up over time in the accumulator, and then the accumulator can't release the pressure. Um, we'll have to suck it and see, but anyway, we're going to follow this procedure. So, we filled it back up again, a whole lot ran out again, so I don't want to get to it. I think it spilled, well, more spilled out on the floor than I think I'm going to put into it, but anyway. So we're pretty happy that it's, it's level with the filler here, you know. So, Volvo says 40 mil. So we'll pull 40 mil right then. Roll it. And how do you measure 40 mil? So what would that be? 
Twenty, you say? There's about four there. Isn't it? Yeah. I'll do yours. So, bung with our our new uh, copper washer that we got in our kit. 35 newton meters it says. So. Well that's basically it. Is that a permanent fix? Don't know. Not sure. The pressure accumulator could build up and build up and build up over a period of time and he could be back to where he was. So what we could do then is get the uh, DEM or the control module, whatever you want to call it, uh, do that software update so that um, you know the, the, the new spill valve that we'll have in there doesn't uh, let the same amount of fluid through it, so, or the, the quantity of fluid. I don't know whether the punter is going to go for that or not, if this doesn't fix this, because he did mention, why not? Why do we not just take a prop shaft off and just do away with the all-wheel drive completely? So this will be a D5 front-wheel drive, and, you know, there's no problem doing that. We can do that, like, and uh, it'll be fine. You, you wouldn't even know, probably and it'll pass MOT or it and stuff like that, you know, with no prop shaft on. So we may have to do that. Don't know. Uh, for the moment, it is driving perfectly. Just, just for me driving this thing, after we did that oil change now, you know, just for me driving, I can tell that this is, this is not locked up because whenever you, you know, slow cornering, with the front wheels, you know, turning whatever, you know, the, if the all wheel drive is engaged, you know, the back is trying to push the front, so it doesn't corner nicely, you know, it doesn't go into the corner, turn in, so you can tell, but just by driving it, but, uh, you know, the way we looked at it was, you're going to need that service anyway, you know, it should have been done prior to now, 300 odd thousand miles in this car, it's a 2011 car, what's 12 year old, 2023 it is, time of recording, just to show you here, now because I, uh, it's my habit of blowing out those haldaxes with an airline to get as much oil out of it as I can possibly get without actually stripping it down, taking it apart. And you get a right bit of extra oil out of it. There's, I don't know why other people do that or not, but I do that. Uh, I did, there's a video on the channel of a haldax 5 and uh, you know, I did that with that one. But this, where, you know, I, I really did give it a good bit of blowing out because I wanted to make sure the oil ways and the journals and stuff like that, you know, they were clear so that the pressure can bleed back into the, you know, the bottom, into the sump. So anyway, when we did that second refill, second level, you know, you heard this pipe googling, gargling and stuff. And that was because you know, this thing was nearly empty, you know. So this is what was left out of that 0.85. Now we did, we took another 40 mil out. Well, it's probably more like 50 mil to be honest with you. So we have a taste left in it, you know, so if you were, so it doesn't use the full container. But again, I get as much oil out as I can. If you just let it drip out itself, you know, you'll probably have a right bit left over. There's no, there's no pungent smell of that stuff. So if you noticed on the syringe, and it did say, I will maybe take 50 mil out of it. So I had it at 40, but it was also, you know, the spout there. So there's probably maybe 10 mil in that spout. So it's more, probably more like 50 mil I took out of that, you know? So, but I'm happy enough because again, the Freelanders, the Freelander 2 guys, maybe you're watching this, their specification is remove 70. So I think if you're between 
between those two sort of for a level your grand but anyway that's my thoughts on it maybe some people go oh no you have to do what it says in the book but there you are okay many thanks for watching and uh maybe you got something out of all that there's there's a wee bit there maybe if you're just doing a, a maintenance thing you know you don't need all the information at the start but waffled on for long enough and thanks very much for watching as ever and all the best and There's a lot in that Play-Doh. Yeah, buy one at.